Hey, you know what? Tinted right? windows don't mean nothing. They, they know who's inside. inside. Straight up hip hop from New York City. So I'm celebrating 50 years of hip hop by posting my documentary that was made in 1986 in New York City. By posting it on my Facebook and telling you a little bit about it. My first hip hop records I heard, late 70s, Sugar Hill Gang, then The Breaks, Curtis Blow. But it was only when I heard the Beastie Boys, it was 1985, the Beastie Boys 12 inch, she's on it, when I thought, wow, this is amazing. And that really got me started into hip hop. Of course, the guitars were there, so me being, you know, rock fan and listening to rock music. Uh, it helped to appreciate the hip hop and little by little I got more interested in it and I had this radio show. It was national radio but we were like a college station and the people that would listen to our show mid 80s they were expecting us to play garage rock, American garage rock and you know sort of pre Nirvana kind of music. And uh, then suddenly we started playing this hip hop and people were kind of shocked and said, this is no music, saying, you know, stop this, this fad, this, you know, stop, this is just a fad, this is gonna blow over. But we just, uh, I thought, you know, this is probably the new music. I mean, this is probably the new rock and roll, like when people first heard Elvis, something like that. So uh, we persisted in playing uh, these records that I got from, uh, record stores in Amsterdam that would import all these records and small labels and uh, we'd go there and I'd go there with my colleague Fons who was my co-host at the station and we just went through all the hip-hop 12 inches and took the ones that we liked and played them on the radio the next Wednesday. This was a show we did once a week. At some point I got the opportunity to make a couple of documentaries for the same network, but then for their uh, TV department. I remember thinking, okay, the number one film we have to make is a film about hip hop music and how it originated. I thought if we can explain in this film why this music started in New York in, you know, relatively poor neighborhoods, and we can explain or we can get to know these young kids that are making this music, then maybe people will more appreciate it more. So I was kind of on a mission. And so yes, we got to go to New York to film this documentary in early 1986. Oh, I forgot one thing. <laughs> The station had told me, you can do this film, you can do these documentaries, but I want, you to, I want you to bring a host to the shoots. And I said, but it's a documentary, why do we need a host? You know, I wasn't in for that at all, but I was forced to, to get the host, so. And he was, a, he was a nice guy, Marcel from Belgium. He was a very nice guy. He had made some comical programs for the station that were reasonably successful. So my boss at the station thought it would help the film if there was some kind of funny guy <laughs> doing intermezzos in between the, uh, the information we would be getting in the film and, and the scenes we would get with the artists and the you know young kids in the street. So I didn't think that was a very good idea. I thought, you know, this is a, you know, this is a real sociological uh, film about how this music started. Why make it make fun of it, you know? So, so I was kind of disobedient. I decided, and I told Marcel, Marcel, you're just going to do some stand-ups. You're going to tell people where we are, who the people are we're going to see, and that's it. No funny stuff. So Marcel was very nice about it. He said, okay, no funny stuff. So when we came back and I had edited the film and uh, I was in the editing room and then my boss came, he hadn't seen anything. 
of the film yet. And uh, he sat down, <laughs> he saw the film, and he got so angry at me. What kind of bullshit is this? You promised to take Marcel as, you know, as a funny guy. And why are you doing him, letting him do all these sort of standard, you know, kind of standard television stand-ups? I said, well, that was my choice. I thought that suited the footage best. So he was furious. And I remember driving home thinking this film is a total disaster. You know, maybe he's not even going to broadcast it. <laughs> so. So I had this beautiful contact with Bill Adler from Def Jam Records. They were the most important record label at that moment in New York for hip hop. And, uh, you know, they were associated with or recorded records with LL Cool J, Run DMC, uh, Houdini, and uh, many, many more. Anyway, so Bill Adler was a big help because I knew him from before when we would call Def Jam and say, hey, can we do this radio interview with the Beastie Boys or with LL Cool J? And then Bill would be very helpful and somehow managed to get them on the phone. And I remember we driving in this cab to the Bronx, now to Harlem actually, we were sitting in a cab, three white guys, you know, young white guys, and we're sitting in the cab, and this cab driver sees us, and he looks in his mirror, and he goes like, what, what are three white guys like you going to do in Harlem, <laughs> in the midst of Harlem? In Harlem, we were in the daytime, and, you know, we wanted to shoot some footage of the just people in the street, and so we asked the police officer, who was standing at the crossroads of a, you know, two relatively busy streets. He said, I, he said, well, where can we film? Can we film? He said, well, as long as you stay in the main street, but don't go in any of the side streets. I said, okay, okay. We had to go to this club once where uh, Roxanne Chante and Bismarck E were gonna perform at midnight. I think they were doing like three shows in a night, you know? Uh, and then they come in, do their show an hour, and then they get in a car and go to the next show. So we went to this club in, in the Bronx, and our show was going to be at midnight. And we had filmed some, some young guys from uh, the Lower East Side. They had this gang. They said, it's not a gang, but they said it's a crew. CBS crew, they said. And we told them about going to the Bronx, and we said, oh, we'll be your bodyguards. And we said, well, you meant to look after your, to look after your equipment. I said, okay, uh, maybe that's not such a bad idea. And uh, so then we came to pick them up on that particular Saturday night that we're going to go to the club. And then this guy uh, gets in the car, and he has this huge baseball bat with him and i thought mm, maybe that if other people see a guy you know carrying around a big baseball bat maybe that's not such a good idea so i asked him please leave it in the car only get it you know and it's really necessary so but we parked really close to the club and everything was fine we just went in and out of the car got the equipment shot a really nice scene in the club with you know kids in the audience it's just wonderful we were in new york for these two weeks we were also shooting a documentary about iggy pop simultaneously we were flying to detroit to film uh, some stuff there with the people that he knew way back then, and Iggy Pop, and we interviewed him in New York. <laughs> so uh, then the, the 14 days were almost over, and the one artist I had not spoken, or we had not seen, was LL Cool J. And of course, he was at the top of our list, because he was going to become huge, we felt, and we knew his first record was sensational. So we had to have LL Cool J. So I was constantly calling 
from my hotel room in the morning, Bill, Bill Adler, when can we do LL? He said, yeah, he's busy, he's, you know, recording, he's busy and this and that. And I felt, you know, the clock ticking and I was pushing him more and more. I said, please. So in the end, that sort of uh, worked out. It helped because Bill set us up for a meeting in Queens where LL Cool J was staying with his grandmother. So, and this was all, you know, non-rehearsed. This was all, so we get there, get our stuff out of the, out of the car. I go to the door. I ring the doorbell and, and this old lady, beautiful old lady comes in the door and says, oh, very friendly. Oh. I said, well, mm, is LL Cool J in the house? She said, yes. I said, okay, okay, wait, wait, wait. I'll get the camera. <laughs> so we will ring the doorbell again, and then my host will talk to you and uh, ask you about LL, and then we'll just see what happens. Hello. Hi. Is this um, LL Cool J's home? Yes, it is. You must be his grandmother. I am. So this was, I think, the last day of the two weeks of our shoot that we actually got to film LL in his neighborhood and you know it was one of the most beautiful scenes of the film especially when he and his buddy you know when they start walking down the street and explaining you know what they think is hip-hop it was inevitable just like anything else you know it takes time for you to get these things you know female rappers will be you know they're out there eventually they'll be a big successful group you know it's only it's inevitable this takes time, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. The male rappers haven't even got to where they're supposed to be yet. You know what I'm saying? We want to be way up there, like, just like that, that jet going through the sky over there, yeah. you know what I'm saying? We want to be way up there. Too. Then we edited the film, and first my boss wasn't happy, as I told you. But, you know, the film got broadcast on Dutch national television, and actually it's only, you know, since there was no social media, email, and anything, we... We didn't really know if people had watched it or what people thought. I don't, I even think some of the uh, newspapers or music magazines were doing like, oh, you know, they're making a big deal about nothing. What is this hip hop music? So, so it was very quiet uh, uh, premiere of the, of the uh, film on Dutch television. We got some reactions and they were positive, but nothing big. And, um, uh, it was only years later when I started talking to some of the Dutch hip hoppers that I heard that they, this, this film was like the Bible for them. My Adidas walk through concert doors and roam all over Coliseum floors. I stepped on stage at Live Aid. All the people gave and the poor got paid. These were, you know, the people that they admired. They bought their records, but they had no idea what their life was like, where they're from, and how they made their music, etc., etc. And this was all in the film. So, so I talked to people who had watched the film like 80 times. It was really great to to see that it was so appreciated by these kids, uh, the work we did, and uh, and then later um, when YouTube uh, was around and my film or clips from my film started. Uh, appearing on YouTube. I was contacted by people from New York who said, hey, how come you have this footage from uh, Mr. Magic, you know, at the radio show, the hip-hop radio show of New York back then. Non-stop music. Turn the boxes up, it's big fun in the big town. Can we see the whole film? So I send it to them and they saw it and they said, we're going to release it in the U.S. So that's when this was made and released, I think 2012. And then the film got some extra viewings in New York. I went there and met some more people and School D came, you know, the underground rapper from uh, Philadelphia. You know, after that, the film went all around the world basically and got reviews, great reviews in America, England, Australia. I went to Australia to screen the film there with you know, hip hop fans. So that was wonderful. Consequently, when we hear drums and we hear bass, if it's played, you understand, we pat our feet to the beat. So thanks for watching, and I hope you'll enjoy Big Fun in the Big Town.